love to share, you know, but won't they let me do it? You know, that's my admin. So this is something, that's why I, one thing I need to say, I can even bring this presentation to my boss and look, ARL is now advocating that white paper. So what does it mean for you, G? We can continue, we already use nickel, but we don't have nickel. This is something that we can uh, use as, not only just as a stop gap, but share with SQL, so we can say, hey, SQL, we have the Wikidata, we're not SQL member, but you can ingest our data and do something with it. So I, I love to share it. I'm going into OCLC and working <laughs> with the council, so we are in the culture cooperative for a long time. But what does open mean? What does data ownership mean? Who has the right of data? So these are the questions I still have. As you said, ours is actually, it is a little bit more curated in a way. We go by collection by collection, and it's a lot because of either what the curator wants or the collection order. Um, for the artist names, for instance, uh, it's, like I said, it's a partnership with the Oregon Arts Commission, and that's something they're actually really interested in, is they have they got a, a new um, sort of registrar on the back end, and they're really interested in, in adding that into their systems. And we have that pipeline for them to go into the game. Like, um, so, they're, so that's a great way to support that partnership. Um, and also for other collections, a lot of it is based on the kind of research use and how popular they are. So I mentioned Berkshire Fast Warner collection because we have a lot of digital projects around it. There's several collections, both at our archives and our museums. Our kind of collections at our museum on campus as well focused around her. So um, that brings in a lot of uh, researchers. So we're really happy to create those authorities for that. And those are kind of first on our um, eco-sharing list as well. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more piecemeal, if you will. Um, Automated, where we can kind of uh, take this information out of our local control vocabulary manager and easily transform it into the native and eco process. So, um, yeah, that answers your question. Well, I, I think ideally we'd like to, we are a native institution, we'd like to um, share it that way, but the things we don't really have the staff to make up, obviously, we don't for, for every single author that um, is in our repository. Um, as I mentioned, we would like to make this data available as linked open data. We haven't really discussed that, how we would do it much in any detail yet, since we're still really in the early phases of designing the idea for the prototype. So, but that's something that we'll keep in mind. So at Hopkins, um, the RDF file that I was talking about was literally just sitting on a shared drive. Um, and it was not exposed in any way. Um, like, we didn't have resolvable URLs. They were just there as kind of placeholders. Um, in doing a new version of this process at MIT, the sharing component would be something that I would definitely be advocating for. Because one thing I certainly found as we were going through the faculty advisor, like committee member list in particular, there were a lot of people that were not Hopkins faculty. So we were having to go uh, beyond just our active directory at Hopkins to find like authorized forms of name. Um, and yeah, obviously both Jeanette and I are dealing with exactly the same problem as are probably anyone else who's worked with an institutional repository. So I think as much as that stuff can be exposed and shared, it's just gonna make things collectively easier. Link data really make the um, global digital library even more possible because all the data linked together. However, I think think about in the multicultural and multilingual uh, environment, sharing data actually is pretty challenging. And I think with the data model and with the conceptual model, all of it will work. So make the linking more semantically accurate. To mention, we are Alma user, Primo, uh, Alindora, the Visual Commons, and Archivist Toolkit, and also later Archive Space. So these are the questions for me. If we use Wikidata, how will all these applications and platforms will be ingested and interactive? That will make it worthwhile. So I think it's the window. 
So a couple of thoughts uh, occurred to me. This is Karen Smith Yoshimura, who's been dealing with identifiers like data multilingualism for a few decades. Um, so one is this idea of the preferred form of the name. Um, preferred form or kinetical form, for whom? Um, I know lots of bilingual authors. They, when they publish in Chinese, they use their Chinese name. When they publish in English, they use an English name. You know, David Lee is really Li Dawe. You know, but I mean, so when you display it, it really depends on context. And one of the very first experiences I had, we're talking to the Syriac reference portal. These are Syriac scholars. So when you're dealing with historical names, people are dead. Privacy issues don't come to the fore. <laughs> Um, but they, they objected to the whole idea of preferred name. They didn't have preferred names. They hated the idea. What do you mean pick one? This author is known by this Syriac form in this country during this period, and he's known by this form in this period. And there was no such thing. It's just one form. It depended solely on context. So I think one of the things to consider is how to present the information, the preferred script of the user in that context. You can't assume everybody in this country uses English as a first language. It might be the state's official language, but we know we have communities where they speak other languages as a first language. And we insist on prefer, you know, presenting transliteration of forms or so forth. Here you have Joy, who I, I can't read your Thai name. You publish only in English. If I had seen your Thai name, I would never have associated with you. But your Thai colleagues back home probably would like to know the Thai name, even if you go by your own name. So how, I mean, in linked data, you could say, this is the language, this is the script, this is the region, and the application could be done. But I'm wondering, when we're focusing on just forms, you know, it's the identifier. I love identifiers simply because they're language neutral. There's text stream neutral, and it might not be the same case for faculty, but even faculty publish in multiple languages. So it's more of a comment, but I, reactions would be welcome. I was with a lot of, uh, uh, we have Andy Hawkins subject, which is American University, overseas, all the language for publication speaking, and everything's in English. I had a colleague coming from AUC to Tennessee. We want to add the Arabic name, but because he didn't publish in Arabic, so I sent the name to Arabic name. Oh, but now I got the English one back. So, you know, because of the research impact, we have to be true. I love it. I don't live to honor my name, but for citation, for research impact, that has to be a way to honor my name also, like you said, in context. And there are French university, there are German university people are working in those institutions in the Middle East, they have to publish in those languages too. So this is a question for Sarah specifically. Um, so when you were talking about the opaque names, I, my eyes just kind of like shined um, <laughs> as an opportunity uh, just because for our project in particular, we're working with human rights collections, um, and we're not necessarily trying to become the central or the only institution that deals with minting of things that we need for our repository. So would OPIG names be a good place to sort of suggest people to submit stuff there? Um, or would there also be like kind of an inclination to have like a working group where we can kind of say, I mean, Human rights comes with a lot of politics, um, and so it's very difficult to kind of put the onus on one institution to say, you're going to decide which term is the right term for X. Uh, so just wanted to hear your thoughts or suggestions, or maybe just let me know that that's not the right place. <laughs> yeah, this is, we've been asked this question before, and it's a little political, unfortunately. Um, so the term OK Gate Space was founded, just like you said, to not be institutional, but it's still a controlled vocabulary manager for two institutions. Um, uh, how do I say this? Um, leadership has changed. Um, so we were, we, it was created for that um, purpose, and we have had other communities, like the San Barra community, reach out to us, wanting to put predicates in there. We've talked about it. Um, we submitted a 
as a group, the organizational team submitted this to our board, which is PMOC, project managers, and other pals, I think, something like that. Um, and so they're, they're just, it's kind of with them right now. Um, I don't really know what's been given back to the, the San Bernard community or other communities. I can give you a contact person to reach out to. Um, but that, that was the mission. That was why it was originally formed. So um, and we have the capability to do that. We can host you for you. And um, we're definitely, I think, a little bit more interested in being able to host predicates rather than authorities. Um, so those are some of the recommendations that have been sent off. And I'm hopeful, uh, but I'm happy to connect with you afterward and give you someone you can reach out to to talk about that. I think that would be, that's, that's the point I think we're supposed to share. And we built this application and then we should, so. Um, I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer, but I will look for you afterward and connect with you. Okay, please. Hello, um, this is not specifically a question, but the general thoughts also referring to the previous a consideration that she has done. And uh, the, um, in the era of linked open data, that means uh, things, not strings, my impression is that we are losing some information that in the previous system uh, were very important, were used and very important to identify something. One of these information is uh, the language, not of the person but the language of the string, so the language of the access point. That means this is the name in Chinese. So what happened in the era of entities if we lose this information that is useful to define a context and to, uh, and to enhance the search and the retrieve of information for your opinion? Yes, I agree with you. And as I mentioned, one of my recommendations, I think VR should have some sort of interface by different languages. And I think it would be easier if, for example, if I look at LCNAV, everything Romanized, everything for all the languages. But if we have a more powerful um, interface for different languages by user's choice, as Kevin mentioned earlier, I think would make a lot of data even more powerful. Sorry, I love, I love this stuff, so I have millions of questions. But, uh, uh, one of the things, um, and this is maybe something more for Sharon and Sarah, I was at a really interesting conference in Victoria on digital humanities, and it had to do with archival material. And one of the issues that they brought up there, they had concern about privacy and ethics in linked data. So they had some faculty members that were cross-dressers, and they passed away, but as they pulled together the archival information, they were pulling together things about um, perhaps alternate personas. It was this whole idea of linking things together, and they were, they felt that in some cases, you know, they, they did not they were not interested in having everybody know or their families know. And you know, libraries are often very interested in connecting all this wonderful information, and yet there's sometimes where people would just assume that the pseudonyms aren't connected or other personas aren't connected. And what do we do in situations like that? So, David Van Vector and Raymond Harper passed away already. But the professor here, he came to us, so he's a living person. And David is the head, he's the founder of the music program. So, he has a very uh, large you know, the whole building. Is a, so, I decide not to include him in Wikidata because I haven't asked him the permission to associate him with his grandfather. They use the exact same name. So I had to disintegrate them. So that's why I decided to leave this up to this, uh, my Harvard colleague to contact him to say that 
does he want to have this relationship breaking because he's a scholar in his own right. What does it mean for him to be bound with relative, even though they learn that he loves his grandfather, he can't for him. So that's why. And we ask that we have another gay activist who we want to give the, the label gay activist, but we decide, well, so we send back the draft of our name authority to him and say, okay, this is how it's going to look like. This is for our local collection. So he said, well, I don't like the term gay. I don't want the term community in line. I just want activists as a label. So we, we do work with the living person. And in Professor Washington's special collections, every time we accept um, a donation of archive materials, we have very complicated form to fill out. It's all about privacy, about um, copyright issues there. So whatever um, donor really insists on information should not be there, and that's something we need to be really careful. Even for digitized material, the same thing, and because our copyright issue is also Library use only, for example, designate piece <coughs> to use the material. So that's why look at any all the living persons. I think it's important to really pay attention to privacy, and that's why I'm really concerned with the RDA, LC, PCCPS, with the linking real name and pseudonym, because for certain writers, why they need a pseudonym? Because they want to hide their identity for political reason, for secure reason, and I don't, I don't think that's accurate to link two of them together with under some certain issues. So I think we really, really consider this issue more carefully, and I think cyberspace, that's why I have so many digital souvenirs there, it's trying to private, uh, keep them for the privacy and secure reason, and if you look at all that algorithm in that kind of digital identity management, Algorithm is so complicated. Why? Because they want to protect privacy and security. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I want to reiterate some of what Charlene said. Since we are working with uh, for, for open game space, it is for my unit. Um, it is our collection is mostly deceased, um, so we don't know necessarily what these people might want. But uh, relating back to the accession policies and the um, copyright and any sort of private collections or public collections, that's actually a factor whether it gets digitized or not. So it goes through that review before it even gets to me. Um, so those are those are things that we'll learn from the archivist, if at all, um, if need be. And um, one thing that we are doing, which is kind of problematic, so as now, since we are now moving into the, the NACO process for some of our local authorities, is that we are assuming the gender of them at times. You know, we're looking at the objects and we're seeing Mrs. or Mr. Um, in a correspondence letter. Um, so that's one thing, I, as I've been going through this, sort of, even though they are deceased, I, you know, we can look at um, the information we're putting out there, and we hope that if there is ever more information, that it could be linked back to us, or at least notified back to us in some way. Um, so that's, that's another thing I've been thinking about right now, too. Yeah, as I was listening to you and I revised my earlier comment to say, historical people don't have the privacy issues as much, but even recently did. I, I spent a number of years um, living in um, Asian countries under martial law, where any kind of dissent got you in jail or worse. Um, so the name, it's not just privacy, it's, and it's not even the security of that particular person. Any person who was considered a anti-whatever, the anti-government, it wasn't just that person, but the entire family, and sometimes the extended family as well. So it might be for us the sharing, oh yes, it's the person, but we are very safe here from the consequences of exposing that information. And, and we're in a world now that it's not, even if the person's now dead, if we associate it with the, the living people, the living descendants of that person can also be affected. So as much as linked open data is a wonderful world opportunity, it also has these risks that we have to be cognizant of. And just to mention to um, Tessalina's point, when we're talking about text strings, labels, and wiki data, every single script and language comes, when you represent that in RDF, it comes with a language tag, it comes with a script tag. So you can build applications 
We have visual link data. If you want an application that brings out only the ones that have a um, ZH language tag or Chinese, you could have applications that take that link data. You know, it's the, the whole value of link data is here is the data, and then your um, link data application can take that information and present it in whatever makes sense in your local context. But I did, I did want us all to be cognizant of the risks we have to really associate every identity with the real person. Thank you all for coming and for your really wonderful questions and our really excellent speakers. Uh, this is really, really cool. Thank you.